you know, the, the very essence of the mental game is this. The only reason that the event matters is because we make it matter. Welcome to the Mullins Ferry Podcast, where I will sit down and converse with the superstars, the overachievers, the masters of our craft. Each episode will be a deep dive into their personal philosophies, their habits, the tools they use, and the secrets to not only their success, but overcoming failure as well. First, find somebody you can mimic, then find somebody you can stand, and then try to focus on one style until you master that style. So if you say, I can't do something, well, you're absolutely right. But if you say you're going to, you're absolutely right with that too. People say that you shouldn't define yourself by your work. That is not true. You know what Dave Farley does when he's, you know, lucky enough to be at the World Equestrian Games? I'm watching other people work. Yeah. I don't think uh, we do that enough. This podcast is for all of you out there who share my passion for the job and the desire to always improve. These interviews will put you in touch with the inner workings of the role models we all want to emulate. So let's get to it. You know, there's only so many hours in a day, and it's a matter of what you do with them. Today I'm speaking with Ray Matthews. Before meeting Ray, I only knew him by his reputation of being the expert on trimming foals. This was because of his time spent as the resident farrier at Winfield's Farm in Oshawa, Ontario. Winfield's was a giant thoroughbred breeding operation that had over 700 horses at its peak. Through his time there, Ray's focus was on improving the rotational and angular limb deformities that would inevitably come up in a breeding operation of that size. I finally got to meet Ray in person at a Foot for Thought clinic we held this spring, where he imparted much of his full focused wisdom on an engaged crowd of roughly 50 farriers and vets. I was so impressed with his presentation that I felt many other farriers needed to hear the lessons Ray shared with us. So I approached him with my idea of doing an interview. Several months later, we found ourselves at the same horse show for a short window of time, so we quickly organized a sit-down. A great farrier and friend, Mark Struthers, and his partner, Lauren Hunkin of Synergy Farm, were gracious enough to lend us their dressing room. So, please pardon all of the horse show noises going on in the background. I think you will find that they added some great ambiance to the conversation. Ray started shoeing in 1970 and spent 12 years shoeing mixed breeds from quarter horses to gated horses. Then he was hired on as the resident farrier at Winfield's Farm. There he was responsible for up to 750 horses during each breeding season. His main focus were the foals through to yearlings for the sales. He became a CJF in 1984 and then an AFA examiner for about 12 years. After three years as the resident farrier at Winfield's, he went back to private practice, but still retained Winfield's as a client at their request. In the mid-90s, he moved to the U.S. for a year, and then settled in the hudson saint Lazare area of Quebec, where he'd shod mostly dressage horses. He has done some lecturing, consulting, and clinics over the years. He started to cut back on his workload about 15 years ago, and now he is fully retired. As I suspected, Ray had a lot of great advice to share in our conversation. Even the horse in the stall behind us seemed to get excited a time or two, punctuating Ray's good points with a loud whinny. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. So I'm sitting here today with Ray Matthews at the Ottawa Horse Show. So please pardon the announcements that'll go on in the background and the golf carts driving by. Ray was generous enough to donate his time today in between stops. So really appreciate you doing this, Ray. Thank you. No problem. Glad to do it. So our first question, how did you get introduced to the horse world? Uh, My grandfather and my uncle were horse traders. They dealt in heavy horses and uh, served the logging industry in northern uh, New England. And so I started driving draft horses and logging when I could walk, basically. And uh, (laughs) then we had a small farm, so we always had a horse or two on the farm and that. So I started riding and then got interested in horses and still am today. Okay. So did you grow up in the U.S.? No, no, in Quebec, but we were right near the Vermont border, so we were, they they went across the border freely back then, and so <laughs> sold a lot of horses, logging horses started off with. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then how did you end up getting started chewing? When did that interest? I went to university to be a physical education teacher, and I after a year and a half, I decided I really didn't want to sit in the classroom, and back then, that was kind of the only option for physical education. And I'd always loved horses, and I wanted to 
stay in the men, veterinary college and biology courses didn't really excite me. And uh, being a trainer back then meant that you starved and you didn't have uh, anything to rely on. So my farrier was showing up about three weeks late and charging me what I thought was a lot of money back then. I thought, geez, if he can do that and show up three weeks late, I should be able to make a living at this. So that's how I got started. <laughs> okay. And how did your education start? Shoeing-wise, I went down to Oklahoma Farriers College and spent three months there in, in uh, 1969-70. Then I, I was in limbo for about five, six years shoeing on my own, and I realized I was either going to quit or I was going to learn to shoe better. So fortunately, Bruce Daniels started giving courses in the winter, and so I, I went down. I borrowed money, went down and spent a month with him the first year, and then I went back for a week or two every year after for five or six years. And he basically saved or resurrected my career because I was really frustrated. And back then there weren't pr apprenticeships and everything was really hidden. Nobody would share knowledge with you. So it was kind of a closed door and I was going to quit if I didn't get better. And so Bruce saved my ass. Oh, wow. Yeah. And how did you find him? Uh, through the uh, AFA, probably in the journal and that, uh, you know, or just word of mouth. But I, I found him and so... I'd go down and spend a lot of time with him. Bruce was really generous and really good for all of us. He saved a lot of careers back then, I think. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And, and where was he based out of? He was in Mullica Hill, New Jersey. Okay. It was a fair drive in that, but I met a lot of uh, people who turned out to be pretty influential in the industry. And uh, the guy I'm going down to play golf with today in New York, I met him down there 40 years ago, and we're still best friends. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. That's incredible. And so what were some of the key learning moments or experiences that you had maybe working with him? Actually, how did you first realize that you needed to know more? Just frustration. I, I didn't see improvement in the feet and probably in some cases they were going backwards and I didn't really understand. When you leave school, it's probably the most intelligent you're going to be for about 20 years. <laughs> and I was certainly indicative of that. I thought I was pretty smart until I worked for a few years and Everything that they told me, I couldn't relate to the foot I was looking at in most cases, and I didn't know why it wasn't improving, why the horse wasn't getting better. I just knew there had to be a better way of doing things. Uh, and I was more connected to the horse than I was the owner, and when I didn't see improvement, even if the owner was happy, I wasn't. Right. So I, I was searching, and fortunately, Bruce came along for us. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then was he your inspiration to go through the certification process? To some extent, yeah, uh, but I, when it they started certifying, I just felt it was another step that I needed to take uh, for my own value, my own values, and to try and improve again, and I thought that was probably a means to get there, so I, I wanted to do it. Okay. Yeah. You have your CJF, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And where did you end up doing that? I did that down at Cornell with Buster Conklin and Steve Krause. They were both working there at the time and they were d examiners, so I, I drove down there. I think I took one of my apprentices with me. He did his CF and I did my CJF the same day. Oh, okay, wow. And then did you compete at all? I didn't do it by intention, but Mel Livingston, who was the instructor at Seneca, he was down there with me and he came by and informed me that he'd entered me in some classes. <laughs> And, I, oh, thanks a lot, Mel. Yeah. And they were using Coke, and I'd never use Coke. I'd use coal, but I never used Coke. And so it was, uh, we had to make a bar shoe for the Eagle Eye competition. I didn't want to do it, but I threw the steel in, and I promptly burned it up. <laughs> and so I made another one, and a little while later, Mel came by, and all the heavy hitters, Doug Butler and Bruce and all those guys were there, and Mel comes by, and he says, oh, you, you got third. And I go, yeah, sure. <laughs> he said, no, I'm serious. And sure enough, I got third, so I retired. Then I figured I was, I was <laughs> never going to get top? better. Yeah, yep. <laughs> I was at the top of my game. <laughs> oh, good for you. Yeah. <laughs> then how did you practice for the actual certifications? Did you have somebody you could work with uh, to prepare for that, or was that just at home on your no, own? No, it was probably stuff that I'd done down at Bruce Daniels in the winter over the years, you know, and... I went to every clinic that was available. Bob Marshall was a good mentor. He was one of the better instructors I ever saw in forging and that. And so we always had clinics at Seneca and that, forging clinics. So just from that, and, and I had a shop at Winfield's, and so I'd go over there and practice a little bit. Back then, the quality of shoeing at competition level compared with what you see today was a little bit immature. It wasn't the quality you see today, but it was certainly you know acceptable back then. I got through with no trouble making the shoes, and the time limit was pretty easy for me. Okay. I didn't find it that stressful or that limiting by any means. Okay. 
Gotcha. Yeah. Now, and that's a good segue. So how did you end up at Winfields? That was a bit of a challenge. Politics in Quebec at the time were getting kind of harsh uh, for English minorities. And we had two young children and we thought that we were going to have a better chance or they would have a better chance in Ontario. So we were looking to move. And I knew the stallion manager at Winfields. Through contacts, I had heard that they were probably looking for somebody to replace the guy they had. And so I went and I was talking to my friend who was stallion manager and he said, oh, no, he said, they would never change. You know, they have the best ferry in the world. And that was kind of a challenge to me. So <laughs> I went down to see the manager in his office and I said, I heard you might be looking for a farrier. And he says, how'd you hear about that? And I said, oh, I don't want to say, but I said, I heard. And he said, well, might be. He said, are you interested? And I said, could be. So he had the vet interview me briefly. And then we started negotiating over three months because they weren't offering anywhere near what I was making freelance. And I thought, this is crazy. And then he said, well, you're asking more than what we pay for the vets. And I said, well, that's not really my issue. You yeah, know? right. And so anyway, finally, they kept bringing me back up for more interviews. And finally, we agreed. And so I took the job in that. And it turned out to be probably the best move I made. It wasn't financially the best move at the time, but... Learning-wise, I probably improved by 100%. Just working with the foals and understanding growth patterns and everything, it was probably the best thing I could have ever done. You must have learned so much. Yeah. As usual, the horses are the best teachers, but the foals were really good teachers. You could sabotage a foot in one trim or you could improve them dramatically. The changes were significant and you had to be blind not to see the changes, good or bad. Okay. And as usual, when you make mistakes, you learn from them, and those folds could show you pretty quickly what you were doing. Probably in a shorter cycle than if you oh, yes. worked on yes. mature horses. Yes, yeah. much shorter, yeah. Now, just for the guests, if you could explain sort of the size of the operation that Winfield's was. Winfield had two. They had a Maryland farm, which I wasn't involved in heavily, and then they had the uh, Canadian farm in Oshawa. In Oshawa... From January till the end of May, we would probably be running somewhere around 700, 750 horses on the farm. Wow. And we would probably fall out a couple hundred mares. And then we had a lot of mares coming in to be bred that we were dealing with their foals. And then we would keep some of their foals uh, through the, the yearling sales. So I got a chance to follow them through. But it was a big operation. And they would send me down to Maryland to look at the sales yearlings before they went to sale to see if there was anything that needed to be done. So I did work a little bit down there. And I got to be involved watching the stallions and the breeding operation down there. So I did get down there a bit, but Winfield's Oshawa was about 700, 750 horses for the bulk of the breeding season. Wow. So were you there every day kind of thing? Was it a full-time job or could you yeah. still freelance? No, I was a resident farrier for the first three years. And then I decided that I wanted to increase my revenue. So I told them I was going to quit and go out on my own. And they asked me to keep them as a client. So I ended up keeping all of the account as a client, but I was doing outside work, so I was just freelancing at that point. Okay. Yeah. And then, so what sort of lessons did those foals teach you? What were some of the key takeaways that you discovered working with them? One of the big faults uh, with foals is over-trimming. Being too aggressive, you learn that a lot of the issues would take care of themselves if you studied confirmation and learned more about the growth process and that, and Going to conferences, Deb Bennett, who's a paleontologist and world renowned, now writes a lot of articles for magazines. She said, if you want to crack the fold that toes out, the best thing you could do is push his elbows out. Well, you learn in time their own growth pattern will push their elbows out. So you learn in time you want these folds to toe out and stuff like that that is pretty basic but unless you're doing it and repeating it and watching them you don't really grasp it and you see people you know they look at a fold of toes out and they go oh my god i gotta fix it right the last thing i want is a straight fold or a fold of toes in because he's only going to get worse the fold of toes out is only going to get better so you learn to wait for confirmation you don't panic about stuff ligament laxities, the tendon laxities, you panic at first and then after you watch them for two or three years, you go, this is normal, they're going to be fine, especially <laughs> in the hind end. So you learn to panic a lot less and you learn to be less aggressive with them in a lot of cases. But you also learn that there's a really strict time frame for doing things because of growth plate closures and stuff like that. And you learn that if you don't get it done before they close, you're only going to cause arthritis trying to change it afterwards. Okay. And you also learn that you can't 
at least I don't believe you can use the foot as a lever. The foot is too immature and is not capable of being a lever, especially when you're dealing with knee or hock issues. You're going to change the joints further down drastically before you ever affect the joints higher up. So you learn not to use the foot as a lever. You can use a shoe, you can use a platform, but you don't want to use wedges or tilt or just trim the foot out of balance to crack something else because you're only going to cause yourself more problems down the road. Okay. And when you're trimming a foot on a foal, are you still using the long axis as your medial lateral balance or is it just you want a flat plane with the heels even? I think one thing that you have to really focus on is keeping the foot balanced with the leg. So if the knee is rotated out, you want the foot to follow the whole axis to follow that. Uh, You don't want to look at the foot as an individual piece of the whole thing. It's got to be joined higher up. So I want it to line up with the face of the knee and I want the uh, hairline to be parallel to the ground, looking at it from that position, not looking at it from the middle of the foal's chest or something. Right. Okay. So I'll line myself up with the knee and then as long as everything lines up with that, I'm happy. I'm waiting for the confirmation to help or if I need to, um, surgery or, or shoeing, glue on shoes or something, you know? Okay. Yeah. And then for the hinds, do you want them slightly cow hock, slightly pointing out or straight? Fold on a hind, in most cases, there can be a lot of irregularities and they'll straighten themselves out much more than they will in the front. Glue on shoes, dollar cuffs or whatever, or surgeries in the hind leg are pretty minimal compared to the front. I'd say, you know, three to five percent of what you do in the front. Oh, okay. And they do regulate. You deal with a lot of ligament laxity, tendon laxities in the hind end. And they'll be walking on their bulbs, and three days later, a week later, they're up, and they just keep improving. So I don't panic nearly as much on the hind end. It, it surprisingly helps itself a lot. Okay. And then when would you make the decision that I do need to put an extension on? Surprisingly, you make it pretty quick. I mean, you don't panic. You're talking days, a week. You're not talking months when I say I don't panic. I mm-hmm. mean, with the uh, front end... It's about severities. I made up a chart where I graded these folds at a day or two old, and then I would compare it every day or two, depending on the severity. Again, I'd go in and regrade them, and that they're either improving or they're going backwards or they're stagnant. And that was a big factor that influenced what I did. In some cases, I would glue on a shoe at seven to 10 days. Okay. And at that stage i would probably pull it off three days later because you're restricting the expansion of that hoof capsule if you leave it on for a week you go back and you've got a one foot that's a lot smaller than the other foot okay and as they get older like two weeks a month three months you really see big changes at that point but even at 10 days if you leave a glue on for very long you can cause some pretty significant changes in the hoof capsule because they're they're growing pretty rapidly and reacting to the ground by that point yes exactly yeah So you worked with quite a team when you were at Winfields, right? Like with the vets and the other people involved, how did you guys come to a decision for surgery or something like that? Or was that somebody else's call? At Winfields, they gave me a lot of latitude there. I probably was the one who recommended them, but I would do it through the vet or in conjunction with the vet. I would say, I really think this horse needs more help than we can give it Uh, this way. I think it's going to need to go to surgery and 95% of the time they would agree with me and we would send it, you know, but I would bring it to their attention. Anything to do with feet or legs, I pretty much had the control over and I was the one that would go to the vet or the manager and say, I think we got to send this one, you know. So we got along very well. The vets were very easy to work with there. Over time, we developed a good working relationship, but they did give me a lot of freedom. Yeah, just you build that relationship of trust. Yeah, yeah. I saw a clinic with you, hence why we're here today. I thought there was a lot of information you shared that we all needed to hear. One of the other things you mentioned in the clinic was the use of braces. The splints? When would you use those? Uh, The splints we used very early, like within a very short period, minutes, hours of, of birth. Oh, wow. In some cases, these foals couldn't stand up to nurse, and that was usually a hind end. They were so windswept usually that they couldn't stay up. So we would put a a splint on them, and in three to six hours with a splint, most of the time they could stand up and nurse. The issue with splints is that I tried using them after I left Winfields on smaller farms, smaller operations, and I would never do it again because the help wasn't reliable. You could 
really emphasize that these foals needed these splints off every three hours. At Winfields, we would take them off. We would massage the leg. We would rebandage them. We would put lots of protection in under the splint, and then we would splint them and, and start over again. But I had 24-hour staff. They could go in uh, every three hours all night long and change these splints for me. And we never had sores. We never had issues. But on smaller farms, I'd go back a couple of days later. The splints had never been taken off. You had them digging into the leg. As the leg shifted, you had pressure points in that. So it was a complete disaster. And I would never again try it in those situations because you're causing the horse more problems than you're helping. Right. Uh, but at Winfields, it worked great. This actually leads quite well. And another question I had for you, you had mentioned at the clinic that after you left Winfields, that when you tried to take care of foals in these smaller accounts, often you were quite frustrated because they weren't as attentive or didn't follow the instructions you had given as well. You even mentioned one time putting on some extensions, metalateral extensions on one, and they left them for a month or something. Yeah. Because a lot of us run into these small accounts where they'll start their own breeding program or something. Is there some advice you could give us on how to educate the client? Or is it something that you should just recommend that they send their foals to a place that can be more attentive? Unless you're really familiar with the account and you have a lot of faith in them, I would not attempt it. I would have them send the fold to a clinic or something where they are going to be attentive, where they do have 24-hour staff, and where they are knowledgeable about it. But honestly, here in Canada, especially Eastern Canada probably, I'm not sure where I would send them for that because even vet schools, they aren't dealing with... 200 folds a year, 400 folds a year, like they would be in Kentucky or other places. Okay. And so even their experience is very lacking. Just because they have a vet college doesn't mean they deal in in 100 folds or 200 folds where they're learning and they're seeing the negatives as well as the positives. Right. No, I, I would walk in most cases after the experiences I've had because... It's like a foundered horse. You go in and you're there for an hour, two hours. You're trimming it, you're shoeing it, you're doing whatever. It's the owner who's going to make or break that whole proposition once you're gone. They're there for the next week, two weeks before you get back again. If they don't do their job, what you did in that hour or two is is a moot point. It's not going to help to any degree. So, yeah, I would walk. I would say you're putting your name on that, whether it's a success or a failure. And I don't want to put my name on any more failures than I have to. I can create them myself. I don't need somebody (laughs) doing it for me. (laughs) Right. When it's completely out of your control. Yes. So at the clinic, we learned through having Dr. Patrick Hearn. Yes. Yeah. in, In the crowd, he started asking questions. And it was interesting because I guess you had both worked together at Winfields. Were there ever times where you came across situations where you both kind of were in disagreement? Not really, because like I said, management gave me a lot of latitude. I pretty much had control over the feet and legs and shoeing. Uh, I didn't have to clear anything. In most cases, the vets would come and say, or the management would come and say, we're a little concerned about this. What do you think? And they would ask me if I thought I could do more or change something, you know. But as far as them suggesting, that was never or very seldom the case and I can't ever remember having a disagreement where we both walked away and said I'm not doing that or they're not going <laughs> to agree with me you know I can't remember doing that. Uh, Dr. DeGans was there for the bulk of my time. Patrick came in a little later. I worked with him probably for four or five years but Dr. DeGans I worked with for a long time and it was the same with Dr. DeGans. It was pretty much my baby. If, if there was a screw up I was responsible. <laughs> yeah, full ownership. But Yeah, I had full ownership. I couldn't blame them, but it was a good working relationship. We always had a good working relationship, yeah. That's great. Now, in your private practice, did you ever run across situations where you didn't have as good of a relationship with the vet? When I was at Winfields, I worked with a few vet clinics. They would call me and look at x-rays and deal with foundered horses and different issues. Uh, I did some standard bread shoeing for a vet. I had a really good working relationship with in that, and I never really had any bad experiences whatsoever with them. Once I left there and moved back to Quebec, I had a lot more issues dealing with vets who I felt were their knowledge was outdated and I would lock horns with them. And probably because of my age and my experience, it was easy for me to walk. I would just say, no, I won't do that. And I would leave. And the client had to make a choice, either, which I felt bad about. But 
they were often left with the choice, do I listen to Ray or do I listen to the vet? And I, again, I felt that was uncomfortable for them and not really a very good situation, but I refused to put my name on something that I couldn't agree with, and so I would basically walk or else they would have to go with my shoeing and I would have to take the credit for it or the blame for it. Right. So yeah. That makes sense. When you say, like, the knowledge that they had was outdated, did you find that there were some that you could eventually educate through conversations with them? There was one clinic who... I felt they were more current and I could align myself easily with that I worked with. And there's a vet in New York State who I take my horses to and who I work with some. Uh, But there were the majority of the vets in that area I really did have some issues with. I think, and this is my personal opinion, but I think in Quebec, a language issue is a big thing okay. with farriers and vets because it's hard for them to go. We, we used to take some of the younger farriers down to the States, to the AFA conventions and that, and they went for a year or two and then they quit because they just didn't feel they were getting enough out of the language issues. And it was, I felt it was the same with the vets. They kind of were limited. And I would spend a lot of money every year going to conventions and clinics and that and I would come back with the knowledge and I couldn't use the knowledge mm-hmm. because you know I would suggest a, a check ligament desmotomy and they'd look at me like I was crazy and say you can't do that the horse won't be able to walk and I'm going like uh, we've been doing this for a decade <laughs> I think it works <laughs> and so it was very frustrating and it was a big deterrent for me uh, it kind of killed my enthusiasm at times because I knew we could do more for the horses, but I felt like I was locked right, or blocked at every turn. And so it was very frustrating. And I think anytime you set up your practice, location is everything. But when you get lucky enough or you can work your way into a good working relationship with vets, it's so stimulating because it you're is. throwing knowledge back and forth. You're arguing you're disputing but you're learning and my friend who i'm going down to play golf with we'd be up at midnight years ago and we'd be arguing like crazy and (laughs) no you're crazy that won't work and we would go at it and we couldn't i mean it'd be midnight two o'clock and we'd still be arguing over some dumb point but it helped you know because you had to stop and think and my apprentices were always my one of my greatest tools for learning because they would say well why do you do that and i go well why do i do that Right. And, you know, they'd make you think and you had to explain it to them so you couldn't just walk from it. And so I would stop and think, well, why do I do it that way, you know? And I always told my apprentices, spend a year or two with me at the most because I said, I'm going to teach you everything good I know, but I'm also going to teach you the bad things I I do, you know? So Mm -hmm. I said, go and work with somebody else. And if you take the best from each of us, you'll be better than all of us, you know? It was the same with vets and, and horses, you know? You get into ruts with them and... Sometimes you're so focused on one thing and somebody else comes along and looks at it and goes, well, what about this? And you go, oh, shit, I never even thought of Mm -hmm. that, you know, because I'm so focused on that sheared heel or something else. And that's not what my problem is today. It's something else. Yeah, I think uh, getting into a good working relationship with vets is so stimulating and so critical, especially today. We're dealing with athletes that we weren't dealing with 40 years ago. You know, the the jumps were four foot. Now they're six foot. You know, the... The cutting horses were working at this level. Now they're working at that level. Dressage horses were 15 hands and they could be a quarter horse or anything, you know. Now everything is so finely tuned in that that it's much more critical and athletes are trained like and treated like athletes. I mean, they have massage, they have chiropractors, they have everything. And we're a part of that team. And if we aren't working with that team, we're we're working against it, basically. Yeah. So it's really important to have that relationship. But in areas, you know, you're dealing with vets who work cattle, they work sheep, they work horses, you know. So it's a little tougher than where you're in a specialty area. But there's not that many areas, uh, you know, other than Toronto, you're obviously in a much better area. You get down to Kentucky, you get down to Florida, you're dealing with a lot of really top equine vets and horseshoers, farriers. So the stimulus is there. You you can get excited again because you go, yeah, we can help this, you know, mm-hmm. and learn as you go. So because you came up with that generation before you, they were hoarding their secrets and, and not willing to share. What about it made you decide that you wanted to approach it differently, like that you would take on apprentices? Well, I guess Bruce Daniels probably was the, the stimulus for that because he was so willing to share. I mean, he practically paid you to learn 
like I said, my apprentices taught me a lot just by asking questions and that. So you could see that exchanging ideas, arguing about ideas, it was all for the good of the horse and it was all for our good because we did learn. I mean, like we said for years, you know, you go to a convention and you sit and listen to lectures for eight or 10 hours. And then you go to the bar and sometimes the learning process really started, you know, because somebody would throw some stupid thing out and you'd go, are you crazy? And then you'd think about it and you'd go, might be some merit to that, you know? Yep. And so the AFA, all the associations have done so much for all of us and especially the guys coming up constantly now, you know, they've got advantages we never had by any remote idea. And I think that, you know, the more we share the camaraderie in in the farrier industry is second to none i mean the things the guys do for each other and I, you know I agree. i'm down in florida and you know guys guys helping me shoe my horses you know mm-hmm. and we're we're talking about it we're discussing it and you know 3 months later i look at my horse's feet and i go geez they're looking better than when i was doing them you know <laughs> but we we exchanged some ideas you know and and he's he's telling me you know i'm using stuff you taught me you know you told me about he said i never heard of you know but some of these old uh, remedies and old methods of shoeing i forgot about them and then something would trigger it and i go you know what we used to do this and it worked and i'm doing it again and it's still working but mm-hmm. you know we, you go through cycles and somebody comes up with what you think is a better idea it's like Dr. Redden, and God bless him, you know, when he started out with the Laminitis Symposium, he took us all on a tour with him, and five or ten years later, a lot of us thought, this is where we were ten years ago, and we, <laughs> we went on a full road trip with him oh, really? to get back to that point, you know. He was brilliant, and he had a lot of good ideas, but he was growing where we were growing ten years previous, and because of his stature... We got sucked into his world, and we went back through the cycle again. And then we, 10 years later, we realized we were already here. What were we thinking, you know? <laughs> but you did learn some stuff along the way. It wasn't totally negative. But, you know, you do you got to be careful because cycles and people's ideas aren't always, just because they're at the podium doesn't mean they're right. Right. There's a lot of guys in the Hall of Fame and there's guys out there in the back 40 that can teach you tricks that they can't teach you, you know. Mm-hmm. So just because you have stature doesn't mean you're right. And just because you're some old farrier out there in the woods doesn't mean you're wrong, you know. Some of these old guys are really, really great farriers. They just didn't pursue stardom, you know. Mm-hmm. And I guess part of that process is just distilling it down in your own mind, whether or not you think it's going to work, then trying it and seeing what the results are. Yeah, a lot of uh, times after years of experience, you can eliminate stuff pretty quickly because you've been there probably and tried it and failed. Mm -hmm. And probably some of it is just the artistry because, I mean, farrier work is probably 75, 80 percent artistry and 20 percent science or whatever. Some of it is just the fact that as an artist, you view things differently. And it doesn't mean he was wrong, but it's not working for your concept, for your vision mm-hmm. of it. So some things, like I said, you eliminate because you've tried it and it didn't work for you. Other times you do go through the cycle a little bit and you go, this is not working, you know, and then you start to apply the science to it and you go, well, it's not working because it shouldn't work, you know? Right. Yeah. And somebody didn't think it through really carefully. So they proposed it and Maybe they were on the, at the podium and you thought, well, if they're there, they must be right. <laughs> I can remember articles in the journal and I would call up Frank Lesseter and I'd say, Frank, how can you let people like this write articles? You know, this is the official magazine of the Farriers. And I said, these people are, you know, writing articles that are totally, totally outdated and false. We've learned better, you know. Yeah. I can remember a couple of uh, people who wrote articles on a regular basis and it was like oh my god you know this is such a disservice to young farriers who are that are coming up you know that's changed quite a bit it's a lot better but at the time like most magazines they need fodder to put in the magazine to fill the pages. and if you're willing to write or capable of writing guess what your article is going to appear probably it's not any different probably in any trade magazine or you know you go to the horse magazines and there's all kinds of stuff you have to sort through it mm-hmm but when it's official word or official voice of the farrier industry, I think you have to be a little more careful. Right. And I thought that was a disservice, and I always brought it up to Frank's attention. You know, thinking, like, this is not right. Yeah. 
yeah, leading a lot of people down the wrong path. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now uh, you mentioned at the clinic that you are semi-retiring or you're heading towards retirement. I'm fully retired are at you? this point. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I was started in '70 and uh, had a few heart issues. So I've got a pacemaker now, and my hip and my knee are bothering me, and I haven't needed to shoot, I mean, for a few years, but I still enjoyed it, and I still enjoy my clients, and I thoroughly enjoy the horses. The last 10 years, I've really tried to improve my horsemanship, my riding, and horsemanship in general, and I've really enjoyed that aspect of it, so I've spent more time and focus there. I don't feel the need to get up every morning, go shoeing horses, and uh, I'm fortunate enough that I don't have to, so yeah, I'm fully retired. I still communicate with farriers and offer help when when they ask for it my friend who i'm going down to play golf with he's 78 and he retired about 10 years ago and he said if you don't retire the only thing you're going to regret about it is that you didn't do it sooner and he might have been right i'm not sure <laughs> what do you think you did differently because we've all known that farrier who's well beyond their capability physically to do the job that they used to who are still working and because they have to. What do you think you did differently? Like, what advice could you give people that would set them up so that they could retire? The business aspect is probably one thing, just like in high school or university or farrier's uh, education that isn't brought out to the forefront enough. A lot of guys are really good shoers, but they're terrible business people. And most clients, and I mean, this has been documented for 40 years, I've been shooting horses that or 45, whatever, that uh, the biggest issue that owners have is a lack of business sense. Either the farriers don't show up on time, they you know they show up and they look like they're hungover, whatever. Mm -hmm. But as much as I love horses and I love my clients, it was a business. And I was there to make a living, and I was there to feed my family and my kids and give them an education. And so I always looked at it as a business, and everything had to make sense financially. Uh, my ego never entered into it. I didn't need to go and shoe the top dressage horse or the top jumper horse. I wanted to keep my business in a tight circle. From the time I started out, my business never exceeded a 20-mile range, probably, other than maybe one or two clients here and there. And I just kept narrowing that down. The last 25 years, my clientele was probably in a five-mile range. Oh, wow. Location is everything. And, I mean, you can beat the bushes because that's where you you were raised or that's where you want to live. But if you're going to make a living and you're going to be able to retire, location is everything like any business. So you go to the, where the horse center is. You go where, where the money is. If you're going to shoe in northern Ontario you're not probably going to retire because you're only going to have 10 horses here and one there and one there, you yeah. know? Yeah. So I always wanted location. When I left Winfields, I went to North Carolina. And then when I came back to Canada, I scouted out areas. I didn't go where I wanted to go. I scouted areas. I went to Kelowna because a vet clinic there asked me to move out there. They had way too much traveling in their business. I went to Red Deer in Calgary, looked at that. It was very interesting, but there were a lot of farriers, a lot of Western horses that don't pay as much as the English horses. My friends talked me into coming down to St. Lazar. I checked Hudson. I checked it out. There was a ton of horses in a close proximity. There was good money there. So I moved there. And again, it wasn't because I wanted to be there, but it made sense to be there. Right. So I think that's a big thing. The other thing is, running a good business, showing up on time, uh, making yourself worth worth the money. Uh, I think today more than ever, but even then, I think a lot of my clients probably kept me for the knowledge I passed on to them, not only about shoeing, but horses in general, physical, not veterinary, but health. You know, I'd see a horse that was probably a little heavy, that was overweight, I would point it out. Mm -hmm. And Often clients would say, oh, I'm so glad you're here. I'm having this problem, you know, and they would rely on me. And I mean, when you look at these studies and the polls, uh, farriers are number one for clients when it comes to sharing information and that or, or withdrawing information from them, even more than the vets. We see them on a regular basis. The vet might only be in once a month, once, twice a year. Right. But they trust us if you build up that relationship. So I think they relied on me a lot for that. And I probably... In some cases, that's why they kept me was because they well, they wanted the knowledge that I would share with them, you know. And today, 
owners aren't educated like they were years ago. The barn help isn't educated at all in a lot of cases. And a lot of the young professionals, farriers, vets, come from the city. They don't have the animal background, so they don't have the knowledge of how to handle the horse. And I think that's a big detriment to a lot of people. And I think it gets a lot of the young guys in trouble, both physically and the client can see that they're not getting along with the horse. Mm -hmm. I think that horsemanship is one part of it that needs to be improved a lot. You know, everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people go in, it's just a horse. You know, you grab the leg and you pick it up and the dumb horse won't pick it up. Horse isn't dumb. The horse has to be treated with respect. He's got a brain. If you teach him to cooperate, you've got a good client for life. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to spend time arguing with him and fighting with him, you're going to have a bad horse for life and you're going to probably lose a client eventually or you're going to wish you'd lost a client because it's going to be hell. <laughs> yep. So those things. And then, you know, as far as competition goes, I never got involved with it because I'd showed horses and I found out I could buy the ribbon a lot cheaper than I could win the ribbon. Mm -hmm. And there's so much physical stress and so much time involved with competition. And I, I know it helps farriers a lot in learning the mechanics of making a good shoe and addressing the way it's put on. But factory shoes are so good. Uh, today, if you learn to work with that piece of steel as opposed to a bar of steel, I think you can get a lot more done in early on in your career, especially, and do a better job of it. I think that way more time needs to be spent on learning confirmation, learning the anatomy, and learning a form to function and the dynamics of it. Uh, that's where I wanted to focus because I could see the changes and I always felt I could get the job done with the factory made shoe early on 48 years ago you had to make shoes in a lot of cases diamonds and you were lucky if you get without back punching you couldn't get the nail up more than half an inch in the foot <laughs> because of the way they were punched so right. you did have to do a lot of work but today factory ma made shoes are so good you can make the adjustments you need so quickly that i can't justify going to competitions myself and spending the time it would take to win at competitions today as opposed to spending that time under the horse and really studying what that horse needs. That was where I got my enjoyment. I used to show horses and compete. I can understand the competitive level and the desire to compete. But for me to support my family and to look forward to a retirement, I found that I needed to be under the horses and learning from the horses. And I really liked the idea of looking at what I was doing wrong and trying to improve it, you know, as opposed to spending time in other places. But that was just me. I, I really enjoyed seeing if I could make horses better through studying their conformation, their anatomy. And like I said, the foals taught me so much about that from zero to two-year-olds that that just fascinated me. And I, I would go to conventions and I would sit at every clinic I could get to that day, every every clinician I was fascinated with. And the competitions just didn't excite me. I mean, I would go and I would marvel at the work they could do, mm -hmm. but it didn't, wasn't something that appealed to me. And again, I saw a lot of guys come out with rotator cuff injuries, elbow injuries from pounding steel and practicing, you know, and... I just couldn't justify it because I felt like I needed to make a, a better living, make more money. When I say that, I don't mean just throwing out work because you can certainly do that. You can do 20 horses and just you're just nailing on shoes. You're not helping the horse. But I really enjoyed servicing the horse. And I used to tell clients when they would suggest I do something because a vet or somebody else had told them something to do, I would say, listen, I'm shoeing your horse. I'm not shoeing you. <laughs> I said, I'm trying to make the horse happy. If you're not happy, then you can fire me. But I said, I'm not going to do that just to satisfy you. I'm going to do what I think the horse needs. It was like, you know, I would fit a shoe full because the horse needed it and the shoe would fall off and they'd say, well, this or that. I'd say, I put it where it needs to be. If it falls off tomorrow, that's your problem, not mine. Right. The same thing with that. I mean, if a shoe came off next day, the next week, I charge for it. I can't be running back and forth putting on shoes because if I do that once, I've lost the profit margin on yeah, my original yeah, shoeing, yeah. you know. Yeah. So everything was geared towards making money. I, I Everything had to be justified. I couldn't keep going back. And statistics I've read, you know, is that 
10 or 15% of your clients make you money. There's another percentage that you break even on. And then there's that big percentage where you lose money because you're traveling. They're never happy. So you're back and forth, back and forth. Mm -hmm. And they're a loss to you. And Davy Duckett was probably, you know, years ago, he said, I put on four open shoes. He said, if it takes anything else, I refer it. And Davy Duckett was the premier competitor. I mean, he could make shoes faster and better than anybody. He won every competition going for years. And he never made a shoe. And he never put on bar shoes. He never put on wedges. He never did orthopedic work. He said, if I shoe horses to make a living. And he said, I put four open shoes on. He said, if I need bar shoes, I need orthopedic shoes. He said, I refer them to you or somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that stuck with me, you know, because... As much as you love it, if there's somebody else who wants to specialize in it and can charge three times what I charge, yeah. let them do it. But I can put on four open shoes or I can reset four shoes and make a very good living. I don't need to get into the specialty work where I, in my area or with my clientele, I can only get to a certain limit. And then I'm done. Yes. And then you maybe take a hit. Of, yes. Of and, profit. and you have clients who, you know, the first time you go in and you charge them four or five or six hundred dollars for a job. I don't care what it costs. I just want it done. About the third trip in, it's like, <laughs> can you give me a break on this? It's <laughs> yeah. getting a little expensive. <laughs> and you're going like, we're really at a critical stage now and you want me to stop. Yeah. So, yeah, I got Davy Duckett's point very well. And, and I did keep always keep that in mind, you know, because I see guys running around doing foundered horses and spending three, four, five, six hours doing it and charging somebody 400 bucks. And I'm going like, I could have reset six horses in that mm -hmm. time, you know? Yeah. I just can't justify it. There's a lot of uh, truth to what you said about young guys and a lot of fairies having to work till they die because they just never got it. You can make a lot of money, but you aren't taking home much, you know? And, and I yeah. think a lot of guys have a, a real trouble with gross and net mm -hmm. income, you know, and they go home with $600 at the end of the day or a thousand dollars. And they think, wow, I really cleaned up, but they don't realize that they got a truck. They, they just drove 400 miles that day from client to client. And at the end of the day, they probably got 60 bucks, not a thousand bucks, you know, made less than minimum wage. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of young guys, I think their ego gets in their way because they see guys driving all over the country from Toronto to Quebec City to New York. And, you know, they're making a tremendous amount of gross, but they're buying a new truck every two years. Right. Yeah. And they're never home with their family and they're paying motels, they're paying meals on the road and they're not charging enough for it. If I can get Two hundred dollars in my backyard, and I drive a hundred miles. I need four hundred dollars, yeah, minimum. Right. And I can remember going ten miles down the road, and I said, "Who was your previous ferry?" Or, "Oh, he came from here." And I go, "That's like three hour drive." And and when I hand them the bill, they say, "Oh, you charge me way more than that guy." And I'm going, "Like you told me, you drove three hours." <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah, I think, you know, they need a business course in a lot of sense, a lot of ways. And I think that if they invest some money instead of spending a lot of money running the roads, you know, just running to do clients where they're not making much money. I think that if they start investing early on, like they always tell kids, you know, if you invest a hundred dollars a month or, or $10 a month when you're 20, when you're 60, you'll be able to retire with a million bucks or whatever, you know, I think that holds true. But when you're making that kind of money and you're working that hard and sweating that much, you always feel a little bit entitled. Yes. And on the way home with that thousand bucks, you stop and you go, you know what? I deserve that new whatever. Yep. And you yep. buy it, you know, and then you got all these toys and you're working 12 hours a day and you don't have time to play with the toys. <laughs> yep. And at the end of the, uh, two years, you sell the toys for a tenth of what you paid for them. Yep. Without getting any enjoyment out of them. Yeah. 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 All of that is would have fallen under this question. What other advice would you give somebody just starting out? Like other than choose your location and plan ahead, basically. Yeah. Choose your location. By all means, apprentice if you can. I think sacrificing two, three, four years when you're starting out is the best investment you'll make. I agree. I can remember when we had an apprentice exchange program, some of my apprentices were lucky enough to get on it and that and those guys could travel Europe and the Europeans would come over to America and work six months over here going from ferrier to ferrier in the States and learning. It was a big sacrifice, but they were became, you know, the top level farriers. Right. And they're making a good living today. So apprenticing would be a big thing 
And then location would be definitely number number one or number two in my program because I think you can beat your head to a pulp, and if you're not in the area where there's money, there's horses in close proximity, you're going to have a tough time getting that retirement package when you're sick. <laughs> right. You really will. Yeah. And you can be you can be really good, uh, but it's not like mail order. It's not like your farrier supply store where they can ship it. You can't ship it. You actually have to go to it. So if you've got to travel 50 miles here and 50 miles there, most cases, ferries aren't getting paid to sit in their truck. They get paid once they get under the horse. In the odd case, yeah, ferriers have learned to put a travel charge, but we're not like the Maytag repairman where you walk in and the bill's already at $85 for the trip, and now you start working. We don't usually see that too much in the ferry industry. So Location is probably the biggest single thing, I think, to make being successful. And, you know, from years ago, the adage was you either work the East Coast or you work the West Coast. Everything in between was tough sledding <laughs> because the cowboys shoe their own horses. I was yeah. at a ranch in Nebraska, and the guy asked me what I did for a living. And I'd seen his yearlings and two-year-olds run up to the fence every morning for three days. And he said, boy, he said, you'd have a hard time making a living here. And I go, yep, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. I mean, no blame to them. They've got a hundred of them, but it's not the same mentality as on the East Coast or the West Coast where there's a ton of money. You know, everybody's inherited millions from somebody and their, their horses are number one. You know, they'll pay any price. Right. Uh, my niece just had her horse shot thousand bucks. She's got three shoeings within nine weeks at a thousand bucks. That's money. You know, you you were in Nebraska or Manitoba, eh, you might have a lot of trouble getting that. You know. <laughs> so yeah, location. And now, for somebody who's say five or ten years in, would you have any other advice if they're starting to feel stagnant or burnt out? What would you tell them? Keep spreading yourself out. Don't be afraid to ask somebody, can I come and work with you for a day or two? Keep going to clinics. I spent a fortune on clinics and conventions in my career, and none of it was wasted money. No. I was frustrated sometimes because with bets in some areas, I didn't feel like I got to use my education to its full extent, but I still had it in the back of my brain if I needed it. And some of my coworkers would always say, well, you have such an advantage because you can talk to the farriers on their level. And I go, well, so can you, you know, just do the homework. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, you have to do your homework. I never would, I shouldn't say never, but never that I can remember give myself up because a vet wanted me to do something or an owner. I always felt confident enough from all the knowledge I had acquired that I could say, nope, I won't go there. I've been there and it's not pretty. And I refused to go there and I could walk. That's tough for somebody just coming out and establishing themselves. <laughs> But if they have the education and they can back up their opinion with facts and sound intelligent while they're doing it, you can usually come out on the upper side. And the only time I would give that up is I'd say, okay, I don't agree with you, but I will do it. But when it doesn't work the next shoeing, I do it my do way. It, you, yeah. And if they would agree, then I would do it their way. But if they wouldn't agree to that, then I'd walk anyway, because like I said to somebody the other day, my name is on every horse. Mm -hmm. And when we were trimming horses at Winfields, they were broodmares and foals. But I always told my apprentices, you don't know where that horse is going to be tomorrow. <laughs> yep. It could be at one of the best breeding facilities in Kentucky and our name's on it. So you don't screw it up. You know, you look, make it look pretty and make it look good because you don't know who's looking at it. Mm -hmm. And farriers travel so much today that my clients go to Florida and some Dave Farley or somebody picks up a foot and goes, who the hell did this? I don't want my name on that, you know? So you got you to gotta be a little careful. And you and you want to have the respect of other fairies. Your peers are your, everything yeah. to me anyway. I mean, when I work with Larry Rumsby, you know, we always had a great working relationship. And I always admired his work. But likewise, I didn't want my, him to see my work and go, oh, my God. Ray did What's that. What's he doing? Yeah, you got to have a little pride in your workmanship. I would keep working with other ferries as much. Like I said, I used to go down to New York work with my friend Jim Klein. I'd go down and spend three or four days with Larry. Any chance I had to work with other ferries who I respected, I would grab it because, you know, you're doing a horse and you're going, why are you doing that? Or I'd say, well, I would do this. And they'd look at me and go, oh, yeah. The exchange of ideas was always so important in learning. And I think some people struggle. They think that they're taking a hit to their ego by doing that. From what I have seen, clients actually appreciate the fact that you are traveling with these other people. Yeah, I think we all have egos, but sometimes it's worth the sacrifice. 
in most cases, I mean, if it's somebody you're willing to associate with, you probably have enough faith in them that they're not going to put it on YouTube that, you know what this jerk said today when we were doing a horse, you know, they're not going to do that. Yeah. They might chuckle that night when they go to bed, but you know what? It's worth the sacrifice. I mean, if I've been embarrassed before because of lack of knowledge or saying something that wasn't right, but again, it's part of the learning process. It's like most learning is from a mistake. Yes, for sure. And as long as I don't make the same mistake twice or say the same stupid thing twice, <laughs> I'm okay with it. I can live with it. That was really great. Thank you very much, Ray. We'll step into the, the short answer portion and uh, find out what you used to use and some little bits of advice here. This portion of the podcast is called the Stratum Tectorium. These are the short answer surface stuff questions, but it's okay if the guest wants to go deeper. The stratum tectorium is the outermost layer of the hoof wall. The thin layer of cells, also known as the hoof varnish or the stratum externum. Maybe you just learned a new word. I hope you learned some interesting facts about our guest too. Enjoy. The first question, your favorite book, and is there a book that you gifted to others over the years? No, I can't honestly say that I have a favorite book or I do gift books or re-gift books after I've read them. Uh, I have some favorite authors, but they wouldn't be anybody famous or anything. Other than professional material I'm reading, probably one of the best books I've read was referred to me by Dallas Morgan, a farrier from New York, and it was The Silk Road, and it was the history from the beginning of time to practically current time, and it was fascinating. It was so it was 560 pages or so, and it was so fact-filled that it drove me crazy. And after <laughs> 25 pages, I put it down. And I go, no, I can't do this. But then it was like shooing, you know. No, I got to find out more. So I went back, and I read all 560 pages, and I was thoroughly fascinated by it. If people like history, The Silk Road is a really good book. Other than that, no, I read a lot of, do a lot of magazines. Like I said, I'm really into horsemanship now, so I get a lot of magazines relating to that. Books I, I read casually. And when I'm in Florida and not working, I can read three books in a week. Oh, really? A few years ago, I was working three days a week. I'd cut back and I could read three <laughs> books a week then too. I, I'd stay up till midnight reading the book if I, if I enjoyed it. Yeah. So yeah, I love reading. But other than professionally, magazines and that, I just read anything that interests me. I have a few authors that I really like and I've, I usually buy their books. Do you mind sharing those? There's an author in... Uh, North Carolina, who writes basically from that perspective, and he, it's about game wardens and that. I really enjoy him. And then there's another author, which, like uh, a lot of things, doesn't come to mind right now. But <laughs> under pressure. I've I've bought half a do or probably a dozen of his books, and I really find he's a good writer. And I can you know I can put the book down, and then two minutes later I pick it up again because I got to find out what happened in that <laughs> chapter. Yeah. You might be interested in Sapiens. Have you heard of that? It's uh, Noavel Harari, I think. Sounds very similar to the Silk Road. Okay. Uh, it's like a whole history of Homo sapiens. Okay. It, it's very interesting. Sometimes he takes it down paths where I'm not sure I completely agree with him. Like yeah. He theorizes on a few things, but man, it's incredible to huh. learn that yeah. history. So yeah. I'm going to look that book up. That's Silk Road. Silk Road, yeah. Okay. Uh, your favorite brand of work boots? I used to use work boots and I used to use steel toes years ago until I had a horse hook behind my steel cap with a cork and he danced with me for about 30 seconds and I never wore oh. steel, steel toed boots afterward. Really? And in the latter years, I shod mostly in a, in a shoe or even a sneaker in the summer. Oh yeah? After that incident, I, I was never big on boots, but I certainly never wore a steel toed boot again. After that. Yeah. And did you still get stepped on quite a bit and... No, that's probably another reason. I, there was a vet in our area who quit uh, a few years ago, and the reason he quit because he, he had lost his agility and his speed, and he said he was aware that he was getting hurt more often because he couldn't get out of the way fast mm -hmm. enough. I used probably horsemanship. I could kind of sense when a horse was going to go off or something, and... No, I can't honestly say I ever got stepped on that much. I've been kicked a few times early on in my career, really. Again, like most business practices, I would only do a bad horse once and then they'd find somebody else <laughs> because, you know, for a $50 trim or a $200 shoeing, it do just doesn't that. measure up. No. No. Your favorite make of rasp? That can depend on the month and the year. I've probably tried them all. The Lately, I've used Bellatas for the last few years. I think that's what I'm still using on my own horses, That which is all I'm shooting now. <laughs> oh, okay, yep. 
that's a testament to them then. Your dream farrier rig. And did you own it? No, I've seen a lot of uh, really, really cool rigs. Well, now especially, 25, 40 years ago, a dream rig was probably a cap on the back of a pickup, if you could afford it. I had a trailer, a shoeing trailer uh, that I used, and I really liked it. I think the new uh, vans, the Mercedes van, the Dodge van, are really nice now. I see a lot of really nice shops set up in them. The trailers are nice, but in winter conditions, they do have drawbacks. And depending on how much driving you're doing, the axles only have a lifespan. So I would probably go to one of those vans if I was setting up another rig. Okay. I really like them. I've seen some really nice ones, but there are some beautiful rigs out there now compared, yes, there to, are, <laughs> compared to 45 years ago. But back then the cap was 400 bucks. Now those rigs are more like uh, <laughs> 40,000 bucks yep. for just the box, never mind the truck. <laughs> Your favorite type of rounding ham? You know what? I never really had a favorite. I probably have, like most guys, I probably have six or eight on the shelf. More than you can... Everybody More than used. I can remember, and one of the best ones I ever had was one that we made at Bruce Daniels. He was always into making tools and that, and he could do a good job. Mine didn't usually come out that shiny, <laughs> but uh, I used one for quite a few years, but it was one I made, and I just I think I used it because I made it. <laughs> it certainly wouldn't have been the best one or the prettiest <laughs> one. But no, I never had, uh, as far as hammers and that go, uh, I never really had a favorite. No, I, I couldn't really answer that with a name. I, I used a lot, and they all seemed to work. They did the job. It was like a golf club. It was the mechanic more than it was the tool. <laughs> <laughs> right. Gas or diesel truck? Uh, I've had both. Probably gas. When diesel was cheaper, it made a little more sense mileage-wise, and, of course, you're, you could get a lot more out of your engine. But now, with the price of diesel, I'd probably stick to gas. And if I was starting over, I'd certainly haul and pull smaller rigs than I did most of my career, you know. I'd probably spend more time stocking up every night as opposed to hauling my whole week su or month's supply. Right, yeah. yeah. I'm pretty guilty of that myself. Favorite pastime after work? Today it would probably be riding. Uh, at times it was probably golfing. I Sometimes I'd have a, a really sore back and I'd go out and golf nine holes and just the movement of uh, swinging the club and that, I would loosen my body up and I could go home and get a good night's sleep. So I was found that was therapeutic. Plus, in the evening, I'd be out there by myself, so I didn't have any distractions. I could really unwind and relax. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd have to say golf and riding my own horses. Yeah. Okay. Your favorite brand of keg shoe? I guess in the latter years, I'd probably have to say Kirkart. Yeah. If you had to use pads, leather or synthetic? I was never a big fan of pads. If I used them, it was for a, a reason, and I, it wasn't something I'd put on the horse the whole year in most cases, for sure probably leather most of the time. And why was that? Uh, I just felt that they gave the horse more relief from concussion, from shock. I thought they had more adaptability to different issues than that. Plastic pads got better for sure. They were brittle like the shoes. They were inconsistent 40 years ago. Okay. And uh, there were certainly no studies done on the concussive values or anything else, you know, so you kind of assumed that they were helping in that. But overall, I'd have to say I'd prefer leather over plastic. Okay. Favorite type of horse to work on? The English horses were easier. When you got into the Western disciplines, you had smaller horses, more heavily muscled, and they worked you a lot harder. I think a reigning horse will cripple a farrier faster than <laughs> any horse I can think of. Yep. Uh, dressage horses are just about as bad, except that they're taller and they're a little more supple than a 14.3 or 14 hand quarter horse that's got muscles like he's on steroids. Mm. So the thoroughbreds, I always, you know, people knock thoroughbreds, but I never really had any issues shoeing the thoroughbreds. They were supple, they were light muscled, so they were didn't lean on you a lot. Uh, even the yearlings that I would shoot for sales, once you got them, worked with them, I was fortunate enough to work with them, a lot of them from birth. So we had a relationship and they didn't fight with me or argue with me. Uh, so I, I would say thoroughbreds were pretty easy, but beyond that, I would go to a uh, warm blood just because they're lighter muscle com compared to their size. Mm -hmm. The Western horses I always found were really tough on your body. Yeah, I find yeah. the same. Yeah. Ideal number of horses to shoe all around in one day. Uh, you know what? That's changed a lot over time because of a uh, dollar, your, what you can charge. When I started shoeing, I think I was getting $4 for a trim, $8 for a reset or 12 and 16 for new shoes. So you had to shoe some horses mm -hmm. to make a living. And I can remember 
I'd be in a barn at 11 o'clock and they'd say, we've got one more horse. Can you do one more for me? I'd go, yeah, bring it out. And so we shot a lot of horses. I mean, even years ago, I, with an apprentice, you know, I could pull out 10 polo ponies in the morning with no sweat, you know. Uh, today, with the athletes, the value of the horses and that, I think it requires more time, more thought. I think there's more more knowledge, so we're more aware of things. I think we deal with greater issues because of the stress that are put on horses. Back in the day, you know, most horses, their shoes were pulled in November and they didn't see a shoe again till May. Mm. So their feet got a lot of chance to rejuvenate because it meant they weren't working. Now with arenas, with shows, with horses being hauled thousands of miles a year, there is no relief. There is no let up. And the value of horses has increased a hundredfold in a lot of cases. So you do have to know a lot more. You do have to take a lot more time. You do have to study what you're doing, look at things a lot harder. Today, with the money you can charge and the quality that demanded, I think you, you're looking at probably four or five horses on a good day, you know? Yeah. If you've got to travel or throw something else in, you might only get three or four done, you know? But I don't think you need to do what we did years ago, number-wise, to make a good living. Uh, and if you do, you're probably doing something wrong. Right. So, yeah, I would say four or five on a good day would be a good good workload. And I don't think you need more than that. Yeah, to make a good living and be happy with what you've done. Exactly, yeah. Did you have a favorite anvil? Years ago, it was a GE anvil I, I used for years. And then when they came out with the aluminum cast on the bottom, you had to switch to it just for the <laughs> noise level. And they, they were good anvils and that. But in the old days, it was a GE. I used a GE for the first 35, 30 years probably. Okay. And so that's like the future that you're talking about? Yes. The, the yes. Aluminum bottom? Yeah. Do you have a favorite inspirational quote? There was one, and I can't give it to you word for word, but this is getting a little stretched. But if you're going to stand in the shade of the tree, you're never going to learn much. If you go out and expose yourself to the sun or expose yourself to learning, that's when the doors are going to open mentally and otherwise. Uh, so, yeah, don't be afraid to put yourself out there and expose yourself because you're only going to get better for it. You know, the other thing is, you know, my, my dad always said, you're better to shut up and look like an idiot than to open your mouth and prove it, you know, <laughs> and that comes into play, too. And I've, you know, I've been at clinics and that and people say, well, why don't you say something? And I said, I'm here to learn. I already know what I'm going to say. Yeah. So I don't need to say it. You know, I don't need to prove it or argue with somebody. I, I just want to learn, you know, so I'm just going to shut up and listen. Now, if it's one on one or if somebody puts a question to me, I'll do my best to answer it. But I don't feel the need to, you know. If there's a clinician and I don't agree with him, I don't feel the need that I should, you know, say, well, that's wrong, you know, in my opinion or whatever, you know. Right. So that, I think, would be the case where you might open your mouth and prove you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. You, you came up with two from one question. Favorite breed of dog? Did you have a shooting dog with you? I never took a dog with me because I always found it a distraction. Like, I'd have to worry about the dog. It's the same as I never took a phone into a barn or I never took the phone out of the truck because I felt it was a disservice. I'm there to look at the horse, to deal with the client. I don't want the dog getting into a fight or running out the door and me worrying about where he went. Yeah. So I never, ever took a dog with me. I have a blue healer now who I think is probably, probably the dog might be more intelligent than me, but she's certainly a smart <laughs> dog. So I really love the blue healers. And I had a German Shepherd prior to that that was a really good dog too. Most dogs are like horses. They're probably way smarter than we give them credit for, and they're certainly a joy, but a dog is, there's probably nothing better than a good dog. So, yep. And any breed will do. Uh, there's certainly bad breeds and better breeds, but dogs are good. Good for the soul. Yes. What brand of accounting software did you use? I'm an antique. I never used software. I never used anything in my business. I was either paid when I went out the door or I was paid within 10 days. At some points in my career, depending on where I was working, I always had a policy that if I left an invoice and it wasn't paid in 10 days, there was 10% added to the bill. Okay. I always had great clients. I never, I think in 48 years, I probably lost $500. Wow. I was working to make a living. I, it wasn't a game to me, and I insisted on getting paid. One time, I thought I'd lost 500 because the guy moved away, and when I took him as a client, everybody said, oh, he'll never pay you. He paid me for five years, and then he moved, 
and he owed me four or five hundred when he left and I thought oh well I guess I lost that because I didn't know where he'd moved and then I was up at the Royal Winter Fair in Toronto and I'm walking down by the ring and I hear this guy yelling my name and I'm going where is that and then I see him and it's Mel the guy that owed me the money and come on up so I went up and he says I think I owe you some money and I said yep you're right you do and I got my money <laughs> oh there you go <laughs> so you might not have even lost 500 in that time well I probably did but that would be probably max I was always pretty careful about collecting <laughs> yeah uh, what did you use as your planner or agenda uh, I just had my yearly agenda book and I kept all my phone numbers in it I kept my daily accounts in it and from the time I started pretty much I I was the one who scheduled so I would schedule my appointments roll them over every five or six weeks whatever I was doing and if I had one that I had to switch to three or four then I would just pop it in I never left it with clients because I found I could call them two days before I went and I'd show up and the horse would be out in the field and they'd say oh I forgot you were coming yeah so my history has always been I call all my clients the night before and I give them a time Probably my biggest mistake there was that I gave them a time as opposed to approximate time. Yeah, yeah. And so that always put me under the gun. If I was doing it over, I would say I'll be there between 10 and noon instead of at 10.05, you mm -hmm. know. I'd leave myself a little more leeway. But I always found that that worked great for me. And my clients always had a pretty good idea that they didn't want to screw up because I might not come back again, you know. <laughs> and I was always pretty rigid on that. Maybe maybe I was a little too rigid, but it worked for me, you know. And if somebody didn't have their horses in the first time, I would charge them a, a fee, you know. Yep. Second time, I probably wouldn't go back, you know, because it just screwed up my business, you know. And I was there to make a living, not to accommodate them solely, you know. Yeah. Favorite method of soothing aches and pain? Hot tub. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, used the hot tub. Yeah, I used the hot tub for years. I when I started going to Florida a couple of years ago, I gave it to my son-in-law because I had to close it down every winter, whereas that was my prime time. Uh, so I I got rid of it, but I had a hot tub for years, and that was definitely my my go-to method. Now, would you start your day in it or finish it or both? I usually finish it because I would. I always start at my, I got up at five and I left the house at 6.30 and I was under my first horse at seven. So getting up earlier to use the hot tub was, uh, <laughs> that was going overboard Maybe, a little bit. Yeah. But I would get in it and soak for an hour at night with no trouble, sometimes more, you know, on a nice night, I'd just sit there and go to sleep practically. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Did you have injury insurance when you were working? No, I never did. Uh, I just never felt that it was valid. I don't feel m most insurances are truly valid. And I always remember talking to guys or reading about guys that had insurance and it was the worst thing they ever did because you pay the premium and then you have a wait time before you collect. I couldn't afford to take six weeks off to wait and collect. Mm -hmm. That wasn't in my plan, you know, and I can remember Remy Hool, an old standard bread shoer, he broke his leg and he had a cast up to his hip and his insurance wasn't going to kick in for six weeks. Remy says, I'm going to lose all my clients and I'm going to lose a fortune in six weeks. He was back under horses with one leg stuck out to the side shoeing and I mean, he screwed up his back badly. Uh, of course. And then there was a guy over in Great Britain who a uh, horse came down and tore off some of his fingers or his hand or whatever and... He had to wait to collect, and then you collect a minimal amount every week. And then the insurance company sued his client and took them to court. He ended up losing a client. He lost his fingers, and he never got enough out of his claim to be worthwhile, you know. And he said, never again would I use insurance. And based on those experiences and my own feeling, like I said, I can't wait six weeks to collect $150 a week. Yeah. You know, I can find a way to shoot one horse or trim three and make the $150 every week instead of waiting six weeks, you mm -hmm. know. And most injuries aren't going to take six weeks before I'm back, you know. So I just couldn't, couldn't justify it. Probably uh, insurance uh, or having a numbered company so that you would protect yourself against lawsuits today would be more valid yeah. to me because of the value of horses and sometimes the clientele you're having to deal with, uh, that might be more valid, you know, just in case you end up in a lawsuit over a horse. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you work out? Yeah, I did. I, I wasn't somebody who went to a gym, but I always stretched in the morning and stretched at night. It was basically stretching. It wasn't like I was lifting weights or doing anything of that nature, but I always did a lot of stretching. Okay. I always felt that was important. Uh, your favorite drink? 
I'm not a drinker, so it would probably be uh, iced tea or a glass of water. I don't, I don't drink beer, and I never, I actually never drank anything until I probably the last ten years. I got remarried about 15 years ago. My wife insisted I have a glass of wine when she had a glass of wine. So now I have a glass of wine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Favorite brand of jeans to work? Uh, I used to be Lee's years ago. Now it's Levi's. Okay. Yeah. Do you meditate? No, I don't. What would you have been if not a farrier? I might have been a physical education teacher. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I look back and I don't know what I would have done. I probably would have continued on at university and become a physical education teacher, but I I was really fascinated and loved horses my whole life, and it was hard to get away. But back in the day, all the trainers I knew were one step away from bankruptcy, or they were on their third bankruptcy, so I knew that wasn't good. And I wasn't real good at biology, so I knew vet school was going to be tough. Yeah. Looking back, I don't regret anything about shoeing. It was a tough, tough way to make a living years ago, because you had to shoe numbers and not a lot of money for each horse. But looking back, it was... Very stimulating. Very, I met some wonderful people in the in my clients, and other farriers in the industry. Uh, I'm so glad I became a farrier, and I'm so glad I'm retiring as a farrier because it's it is a wonderful trade. It really is. I agree. Yeah. And one last question: Is there anybody you would recommend that I interview in the future? Some of you think that their voice needs to be heard. You know what? There's probably so many out there that none of us know about. Uh, that would be fascinating interviews. A lot of the guys, as you know, probably better than I do, a lot of the guys have been interviewed and quoted so many times. Larry Rumsby is a great farrier. Uh, he's a worthy Hall of Fame member, which he is. Uh, Larry would be a great interview. He, he's on my wish list. I yeah. don't know if he would do one or not. I, th I think Larry will, yeah. Uh, yeah, Larry's really good. Randy Lucart. He would fill your interview sheet many times over. <laughs> great farrier, great clinician. Learned a lot from uh, from Randy. Locally in this area, I don't know so many of the young farriers. Now, after I left Toronto, I mean, it just everybody turned over right. a dozen times probably. But I don't know a lot of them. But a lot of them could be very good interviews, I'm sure. Yeah, I, w I would try and get Larry. Okay. I think he'd be a really good interview for you. He's shot some of the world's best uh, horses and he's traveled the the globe shoeing horses uh he's been all over europe many 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 times and he's got a wealth of expertise mm -hmm. uh, i would certainly suggest larry okay I'll, I'll pursue that yeah well thank you very much ray i really appreciate you're it. you're very welcome it was a pleasure before we finish i would like to say a few words about the often unsung heroes of our horse world the grooms a good groom can make your day have your back and even save your life notoriously overworked and underpaid and yet the good ones make sure that the horses are clean but their legs aren't wet that the ones you need are in that you know all of the details of the one that might be a bit off that you're aware of the nervous and quite possibly dangerous one they coordinate the dates make sure the stiff ones get out for some pasture time before you work on them they hold the finicky ones they take away the ones you've finished and bring you your next contestant on the shoes fit right and they may not always appreciate, but they always do tolerate your bad dad jokes. There are many accounts on my books that wouldn't be doable without the hard work of these super grooms that I speak of. I try to show my appreciation by sometimes bringing cookies or coffee, but I've often wanted to find another way to say thank you. Along came the grooms class endeavor by one of our local vet clinics, McKee Pownell. I was approached last year by one of its coordinators, Molly, to sponsor it. So I donated some new farrier tools that would come in handy for those times when a horse pulls its shoe but doesn't quite finish the job. A pair of crease nail pullers and a pair of pull-offs can get any good groom out of the shoe is held on by three nails and the horse is stepping on the clip situation. Molly approached me again this year and they are making the prize list even bigger for the groom's classes. The Hunter one will be during the Autumn Classic Series at EMG in Palgrave, Ontario on the 14th of September. The jumper one will be during the Canadian Show Jumping Tournament, also at Palgrave, on the 20th of September. The Mullins Ferry Podcast is proudly sponsoring these classes to say thank you to our allies in the trenches. As a farrier, maybe you could start a similar initiative in your area. Or just bring a box of cookies every once in a while to say thank you for doing what you do. That marks the end of this episode. Thank you for listening. This podcast is made possible by the hard and tedious work of my friends at Twisted Spur Media, and I am forever grateful to them for all that they do.
Until next time, take care of yourselves and each other out there.